Welcome to CFTC Talks. I'm your host, Andy Bush, Chief Market Intelligence Officer for the CFTC. Hey, just a quick reminder, as always, there's an important disclaimer at the end of the show that you should listen to. Hey, at the beginning of November, the University of Georgetown held its annual FinTech Week and brought together thought leaders from FinTech firms across the United States. PayPal, Amazon, OnDeck, R3, and Cloud9 Technologies were just some of the companies participating. Georgetown's faculty director of the Institute of International Economic Law, Chris Brummer, was in the middle of it, and he joins us today on the show to discuss what he learned. Chris, welcome to CFTC Talks. Thank you so much, Andy. It is an absolute pleasure to be here. Well, hey, before we get to the uh, FinTech Week conference, let's let's chat a little bit about you because you've got a really interesting and varied background. You've, you've written several books on topics like public and private international law, market microstructure, and international trade. And really, given, given your background in this, how does that work frame today how you look at the the trade negotiations that have been going on over the last year uh, between the U.S., obviously with NAFTA, but also with China? Well, you know, I was just in Hong Kong uh, about 48 hours ago, and we had a very interesting conversation, uh, we being uh, myself and a number of uh, professors and financial uh, regulatory authorities and market participants uh, thinking through international financial regulation. And one of the observations that I had made is, you know, it's really interesting how many of us, at least briefly, had some part of our careers or our own intellectual energy focused towards international trade, especially the number of us who are heavily involved in thinking through fintech. And I think that the reason is that uh, in international trade, there's been, uh, over time, um, a decentralization of power in international trade. That is, more and more countries are becoming integral to the international trading system, uh, which really uh, presents a number of challenges when one wants to think through international trade, both liberalization and also the protection of everything from industry, the environmental workers, uh, and obviously uh, workers themselves. And the challenges of sort of hurting the cat and finding a way to present a format for regulating not just commerce, but services tied to commerce requires informal rules and mechanisms uh, as much as they do formal rules and mechanisms that are embodied in trade agreements. And when you get to something like FinTech, for example, uh, there too, you get to uh, sort of decentralized environments where there are different pockets of influence and power and where regulation itself is, at least from its classically uh, practiced manner, is, is a little bit difficult uh, because you have highly evolving, fast-moving markets right. and, and you have an administrative process that is, uh, uh, at least does not anticipate that. And so I think the tools that we brought to bear in some areas of international trade, um, and in particular, sort of uh, something called soft law and how do you regulate international financial regulation, those same kinds of tools are popping up in different guises uh, as regulators think through financial technology. Sure. And I think that's why there's some overlap. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. I mean, obviously, the development of Bitcoin was um, – to get around to decentralize and and it was really trying to solve a very uh, simple problem, which was to uh, get around international payments to some extent and and <laughs> supposedly to uh, protect its uh, one's uh, self, uh, you know, uh, from the you know say the money supply increase from the Bank of England or the Federal Reserve. And if you read the white paper, obviously that kind of touches upon that. But I guess, you know, oh, yeah. it, it, and so in that space, and you're talking about fintech and the digitization of, of our world and making trade negotiations so much more difficult. And that gets at the heart, of, to some extent, of um, the issue of intellectual property. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, uh, you know, when you're thinking through the origins of, 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 of Bitcoin, uh, you know, that was a response, at least in part to a decay in trust, right? Um, sure. In, in trust in this particular instance, trust in, uh, as you mentioned, uh, in international banks, yeah. monetary, 
um, policy and the strength of traditional fiat currencies. And it, it was definitely a kind of an end run in its own way around uh, traditional uh, payment systems. At least it was an aspiration in part uh, to really, again, a, a decay in trust. And international financial rules and regulations, at least in the wake of the financial crisis in 2008 through 2010, uh, you know, that too was a response to a kind of decay in trust. But it, it, from this particular standpoint, it was de a decay in trust in how uh, major financial institutions had been governed and supervised, you know, leading up to that point in time. And so you do have, um, you know, traditionally this waning back and forth between, on the one hand, uh, industry and regulators, um, but now you have a, a new factor that's driving this pendulum, which is technology. And I think that we're seeing both on the trade end as well as the regulatory end an attempt to grapple with how exactly technology impacts the, the regulatory cycle. And one of those issues is, is obviously intellectual property. And, and, and that intellectual property can be as much how do you invent something as it is data itself. Um, financial regulators are increasingly becoming data regulators. Trade uh, negotiators are increasingly becoming negotiators of data transfers and uh, uh, how data moves. And this is complicating traditional conversations about not just domestic, but, but obviously international commerce. Well, that's interesting because you, uh, and I want to talk about FinTech Week. So, because we, we got a lot of stuff to cover here. So why don't we just jump right into that? Um, this was uh, something you participated in, at, uh, at, I think at the beginning of November. And it was, it was like four days, right? That is so oh, much, yeah. that's yeah. crazy how much work that exactly. is, but also <laughs> how much information you get, right? Um, and, and, oh. and so let's, let's try to, well, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, tell, just like broadly speaking, uh, describe for our audience what that was uh, and, and what you guys were hoping to do with it. So, so FinTech Week, um, and it's funny because uh, Chairman Giancarlo and I, we, we kind of argue about the, the origins of FinTech Week, but uh, this is our second iteration of this particular event. And as I explain it, uh, he'll, he'll say otherwise, uh, and he wants to give credit to me, but we had once had a conversation about how great it would be if there was a, a space for technologists to discuss what they're doing alongside the regulatory community. And you have lots of conferences, lots of conferences, uh, particularly on the industry side, talking about uh, potential directions for FinTech and RegTech and compliance and the like. Uh, but you don't always have uh, a, a geeky, wonky discussion about policy and technology uh, where people really start to dig into the detail. Right. And, uh, you know, he had sort of mentioned this, and I was like, hey, you know, that's, that's a great idea. It's, it's something that universities can play a particularly good role in helping to facilitate. And we've just had this extraordinary opt-in, uh, not just from the CFTC, but from really all of the major regulatory agencies sending their top people and from industry sending all of their top people. And what was in, in originally envisioned to be a kind of a two-day event then became a three-day event for last year, and now it's a four-day event. And now, wow. it, it, as, as, as an official from the European Commission had, had said, it's become a thing now. And, and it's, it's a lot of work, but it is really a, a very unique setting for people to think through, sort of, again, policy and technology simultaneously. Right. So with that in mind, let's kind of put this, let's funnel this a little bit. What, what were your top three takeaways? Uh, you know, I mean, now that you've had a chance to decompress a little bit, although you're still probably jet lagged from Hong Kong, but I'm sure you've been thinking about the conference and, and, and all the information that flowed your way. What were your top three takeaways from it? So I, I should have said the first two days, which is interesting. It was a crypto asset seminar between uh, really focused uh, between the IMF uh, and Georgetown. So day one was at Georgetown. Day two was over at IMF headquarters. Day three, we looked a little bit more at the infrastructure issues and the trading environment and how do you literally value fintech assets. And that was back at, over at Georgetown. And then day four was on Capitol Hill. Um, 
uh, and, and there you had uh, ISM and Amazon uh, helping us to think through along with a bunch of international regulators, international regulatory competition, regulatory sandboxes, and even, you know, how do you secure the cloud, right? So those are a lot of different issues. I'd say that the, the number of issues that I came away with were as follows. Number one, when it comes to crypto assets, um, you know, whether or not it be Bitcoin or whether or not it be uh, tokens from initial coin offerings, Regulating that space is particularly difficult because even amongst industry participants, the definitions of very key basic terms like utility token or decentralization or exchange, those definitions are contested before the regulators even come to the, to the table. And so the, the task of regulation itself is much more complicated than one would sort of Surmise. Yeah, and again, it, it's a little bit, it, Chris, let me just interrupt you because it's a little bit like saying, oh, it's blockchain. And, you know, there's <laughs> exactly. like 20 different definitions. I mean, there's so many shades of gray in what a blockchain is and what somebody means by when they say, oh, we're going to put this on the blockchain or we utilize blockchain technology. It, it, it's just, it's almost maddening because, it, as you said, it, 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 as this has exploded, regulators are faced with the really complicated task of figuring out, like, what is somebody telling you when they yeah. when they bring something in front of you? I mean, you have to dive into actually, to some extent, the code of what's written um, in a in a ICO or for a virtual currency to really understand what it's supposed to be. That's exactly right. And then you have to figure out once you, you're looking at the code and you're a bunch of sort of trying to figure out what, what it's supposed to be and what it's supposed to do, then you ask yourself, well, what kind of, um, you know, market ecosystem and uh, in, institutional environment or infrastructure is it either being traded in or facilitated or being used? And all of this stuff goes into the context of defining how it operates. And that's just one example. Right sure. of, sure. of of the kind of of the challenges that that uh, you have, and yet you know there's certain irony because uh, market participants would like to have regulatory clarity, um, but you know when you when you dig a little bit deep, there's not exactly market clarity, and 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 that creates an interesting set of questions as to what the role of the regulator should be. Yeah, you know? right. Um, to what degree should it be involved in? Provision to what degree should it be in, involved in helping standardize terms, um, or, or to at least translate them in a way so that different market participants can understand one another, or not? You know, right? And and, and I think that that's a, a really that was an interesting takeaway. Okay, from, so what's from, number two? <laughs> I'm gonna I mean, yeah, I'm gonna know, narrow you in here, Chris. We got a few more right, questions right. I want to ask. So I, keep going, buddy. I, I, <laughs> I, I think that the the other big question would be, and I'll just end end it with with this, since there was such an international focus, is mm -hmm. to what degree can regulators uh, really end up bridging three different challenges? Right? You know, I, mm -hmm. I, I I'd once helped right. co-author a paper that said that there's a, a trilemma to regulatory innovation. That is, that you can regulate innovation, you can uh, ensure market integrity. Uh, uh, and you can ensure or, or provide clear rules, but you can usually just do two out of the three at any given time, right? So you can provide clear rules and lots of uh, market integrity, but it's usually at the expense of financial innovation because you're prohibiting a lot. You can provide clear rules and financial innovation, but it's uh, at least historically been at the, uh, at, at, at the cost or at the price of market integrity, and you can provide market integrity and financial innovation, but usually that's at the expense of clear rules because you have to devise all these very complicated frameworks and 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 exemptions and and very highly technical um, regimes, right? And what I see and what the conference was highlighting is the regulatory responses to that trilemma and the fact that different countries sit along different poles of the, the triangle in a, in, in a trilemma and trying to think through, well, well what's the optimal set of trade-offs for us, uh, given the fact that, you know, it, 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 you know, you historically can only get two of those three, but how can you create a compromise so that you can, you can get a little bit of, of each of the three? Yeah, and that's, that's, that's a great way of looking at it. I, I, I love that uh, triangle kind of scenario because I think you just encapsulated really succinctly uh, the, some of the key issues that are associated with 
um, this space. I guess my question is, did anything surprise you from the week? Did anything really jump out at you that was unexpected that uh, you felt was super valuable? Uh, you know, honestly, and, and uh, what I thought was one of the more surprising things, and, and it is, it is frankly the uh, degree to which the uh, regulators themselves were very open about how their thinking was proceeding in certain ways, right? And I and I don't even know if if, if everyone really appreciated this. So we had, for example, Bill, Bill Hinman who came in, um, and you know, people sort of remarked or noticed that he had reiterated an earlier point, saying, you know, uh, Bitcoin, and I think he had also said Ether, you know, that they're not um, securities. Uh, uh, although it can certainly be the, the, the point that they may have been securities, uh, or particularly I think he meant Ether may have been a security at one point or another. And I, I don't think that enough people fully appreciated that comment, not so much where it was ending up, but how he got there. Right. Um, because because that's, that's, that's espousing a certain sort of concept of a crypto asset that is, a highly interesting one, and 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 which is, and it's one that that different members I know of the CFTC, the different commissioners have uh, at least pondered, which is, you know, how what is the quantum theory of crypto asset? You know, like do, do, do you know what they are? Is it always you know is it possibly evolving or not? And there is no 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 clear answer, uh, but but it is an interesting concept and one worthy of 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 attention. And the fact that you can have someone like that, um, who's on the front lines that, you know, to sort of ponder that, those remarks, I think that's, you know, uh, whether one agrees or doesn't agree, I think it's a very valuable um, uh, opportunity. And yeah. I think I was surprised by just how many people on the regulatory side and, and, and clearly market participants, you know, were just willing to do that. And I was very happy with that. You know, that's great. And I, I think we're so it's such a different environment now from where we were in 2008 and then, you know, 2008 to 2013, where, you know, we had Dodd Frank and there was a lot of rulemaking being made in a very short period of time. And there was a lot of anxiousness overall in the financial system, whether or not it was going to survive and all these, you know, things that were popping up in the media. <laughs> now it's a very different way. I mean, we've all, you know, we've taken a look back over the last 10 years and try to figure out what's worked and what hasn't. And I think that that mindset is framing everyone uh, in the regulatory space uh, with this new technology on, on how to look at it, how to develop the frameworks, the metrics for how we judge this. But I have to say, a year ago at this time, <laughs> things were very crazy in the Bitcoin world because it was oh, soaring yeah. in value. And now we've seen it obviously decline uh, significantly. Uh, we've gone from over 18,000 to below 5,000. And uh, Ernst & Young just came out with a report looking at um, the ICOs that were put out in 2017. And they found that almost uh, 80, I think it was 86% or 85% were, were below their initial value with 30% having lost almost all of their value. So I guess the question I have for you uh, is, is provide some context for our audience you know, there was this rush and excitement, uh, similar to, to some extent, about, you know, the Internet in the late 90s. D do you equate those two or is this different or, you know, how do you how do you view the recent drop in the value of of these uh, virtual currencies? Wow, that's a that's a, a good, a hard question. Um, I, I think that there are clearly similarities. And when you read, you know, you know, most commentators will will draw similarities between the two. In, in short, because the internet is a decentralized platform, uh, 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 it it was the basis upon which there was an immense amount of innovation. And and you can think about uh, you know distributed ledger technologies and, and different kinds of platforms. You know, obviously Ethereum in, in particular as a, a platform, a decentralized platform upon which different applications can be made. And so there are lots of, right. of interesting parallels there. I, I think that um, one of the differences between the two is that 
though you had internet stocks, right? Everyone knew that they were stocks. <laughs> whereas, right. You know, when you, you know, whereas when you get to there was agreement that what these things were were representing you know the value derived from other people's work, right? So we get back to orange right. grows That's right. in Florida. <laughs> That's the, and the, exactly, how he ties. Exactly. At, the, at, at the end of the day, if, if pets.com was to do like an IPO or something, right, it may, the idea may have been kind of crazy, uh, but you, you knew ultimately that you had a company and an issuer and, and you knew, you know, what it was, regardless of what the business plan uh, yeah. or how viable the business plan was. Yeah. Whereas when you get to financial pro- some of these these new financial products which kind of operate in the interstices and the gaps almost of different regulatory frameworks that becomes a more there's there's more work up front trying to to determine what it is and and i would also say that it it's creating interesting sources of stress um because it's not just how do you define it but it's like okay once you've defined it what do you do with it uh, and if I could just add, I think that this sort of question is, is it a commodity, is it a security, can sometimes obscure the fact that no matter what you call it, the, reg- the existing regulatory regime on either side, the SEC or the CFTC, is going to have to do something to respond to the specific features and characteristics of that crypto asset, right? So it's, it's, I don't want to say the straw man but 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 the, the question is just the initial question um one study that i'm working with some folks thinking it through uh with some lawyers of our davis bulk is even if it's a security for example and even if you are going to register an ico with the sec are the disclosures that are currently required in an s1 does that really match what these things uh, you know, the, the risks and the benefits of what these things are, right? You know, if you need to price a crypto asset or an ICO, and to talk about the blockchain, as you had mentioned, you'd want to know things about not some, not just sort of basic corporate governance. In fact, that may not be that important as, say, blockchain governance. Like how exactly, you know, uh, does your blockchain work? What are, what's the likelihood of a fork? You know, how, you know are, your, are your crypto assets burned? How are they mined? That kind of stuff is really, really important, and it's unclear when you look at the terms of an S1 that what an S1 would require is even disclosure of those, of those particular issues. On the other hand, an S1 puts an enormous amount of, of emphasis on financial statements, but these are companies that haven't necessarily ever been in operation until right. their, their ICO. Right. I mean, this is very much kind of angel level investing. And, you know, is that really the proper point of emphasis, given the nature of these particular transactions? And are there other kinds of disclosures relating to the coding, as, as you had mentioned, um, to, to the infrastructure and how the, the uh, asset is supposed to function or the invest or uh, the uh, technological team and, and the support staff um, that are uh, tasked with, with getting these uh, financial products and, and, and ventures and projects uh, up to scale, you know, that seems to be more relevant to a pricing decision than some of the things that people were thinking back about back in 1933. And for the CFTC, it's, it's, it's you know, interesting questions arise um, because you have many more, or at least the potential of many more uh, retail investors in what is traditionally viewed to be a professionalized space, you know? Mm-hmm. I, when I teach my kids uh, uh, securities and, and, and ICOs, it's so fascinating. When I teach my SEC class or my securities right class and I ask them, how many of you have traded stocks and bonds before? Out of a class of maybe uh, 80 students, you'll get three or four hands up in the air. <laughs> On the other hand, when I ask, how many of you have bought or traded, you know, Bitcoin, you know, a third of the class you know, a fourth of the class can have their hands up in there, which yeah. means that you have a, a very different kind of set of, of, of investors. Yeah. And regulators are going to have to deal with it. And yeah. And I, very interesting. I, 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 I think that's a great point. Well, one last question before I let you go. What are you going to focus on uh, in 2019? I mean, there's there's so much in this space, Chris, and you're, you're you know, you're knee deep in it. You know, just give me a couple of things that you're going to really try to narrow down and focus in on uh, in the coming year. Yeah. So, so as I said, I'm really thinking about what uh, are the pricing 
mechanisms for crypto assets and what are the drivers that impact prices? Because I think, you know, not so much from a, from a trading standpoint, but from a regulatory standpoint, that helps you think through the question of uh, disclosure and, and what kinds of responsibilities uh, would whatever kinds of intermediaries, and there may not be very many intermediaries, but there could be more intermediaries uh, as, as sort of the financial regulatory pendulum uh, begins to swing. Uh, but to think through, again, how do you value these kinds of assets and what kinds of disclosures are necessary? And I'm also really interested uh, in, in uh, you know, this, this question of quantum computing and uh, sort of cybersecurity more generally. I, 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 there are questions as to the integrity of uh, sort of some of the cryptographic um, techniques used to, to support um, crypto assets. And once you move into quantum computing, what does that mean for cybersecurity more generally? I think those are the, the two areas, at least for 2019, that I'm going to be immediately uh, focusing on. And I think it's going to be of um, a year from now in particular, I think there's going to be a lot of interest in, in both of those issues. University of Georgetown Professor of Law, Chris Frummer, thanks for coming on the show today. I'm glad we finally nailed you down from all your travels to get you on. Uh, my pleasure, Andy. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to uh, seeing you soon. Fantastic. Thank you. That's a wrap for me. Thanks for listening. We'll be back soon with more great guests. I'm Andy Bush, Chief Market Intelligence Officer for the CFTC. Thanks for listening. This has been CFTC Talks. But wait, we're not done yet. It's time for a disclaimer. The CFTC is providing this information as a public service, and it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of CFTC policy. Reference to any specific product, service, trademark, manufacturer, or service provider does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by the CFTC. The CFTC is not liable to any consumer or any third party for any direct, indirect, incidental, consequential, special, or exemplary damages or lost profit related to the use of the information provided or referenced in this podcast. Selection of guests on the podcast does not imply an endorsement of any particular individual or entity. Many individuals and entities provide similar services to those of the guests. The views and opinions expressed by the guests in the podcast are their own and not specifically endorsed by the CFTC. Moreover, the information provided in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice. Consumers should rely on their own inquiries as to accuracy and relevance of the information incorporated or referenced in this podcast and assume the entire risk related to its use. The CFTC is providing its interpretation of market trends solely to inform the public of a framework for projecting possible outcomes under different scenarios. If you have any questions concerning the meaning or application of a particular law or rule administered by the CFTC, please consult an attorney.